probably most of you have been in Westminster Abbey. Uh, as you come in the main door, you can't miss uh, the tomb of the unknown warrior. It's right in front of you, right in the middle. Um, if you go further into Westminster Abbey, you'll find there are lots of graves there. And they really form part of the flooring. You can't go from one spot to another without walking over the graves. But there's one grave uh, on which it's forbidden to walk, and that is the grave of the unknown warrior. Tonight we're going to think about the story behind this grave, what it means, and maybe some lessons that will help us on this Remembrance Sunday. The idea of having a grave for an unknown warrior started with this man, a man called David Railton. He was an army chaplain, an evangelical chaplain uh, in the army. In 1916 he was awarded the Military Cross uh, for saving three uh, fellow soldiers under fire and it was in the same year that he uh, had this idea of having uh, a grave, a tomb of an unknown warrior. Uh, I should say that David Railton has got some Highland connections. Um, after the war he became a vicar in Margate in Kent and when he retired I think his father came from Scotland and he always liked the Highlands so he moved up to Onnick just south of Fort William and uh, he lived there for quite a number of years um, and sadly he was down south and coming back to Fort William by train and somehow getting off the train, the train was still moving and he had an accident and he fell and that led to his death and he's actually uh, buried, this is his grave down at Onnick in Fort William so there's a kind of Highland connection with this whole idea of the unknown <coughs> warrior's grave the man who, who thought of it really uh, has connections to the Highlands well, it happened that uh, David Railton was walking through a French village in 1916 and this village had been fought over several times already, this is halfway through the war and he just noticed, it, really in the back garden of one of the cottages, there was what seemed to be a grave and he went in to have a look and he discovered that it was a very rough grave with a very simple wooden cross and as he went closer to the cross, he discovered someone had written in pencil on the cross an unknown British soldier of the Black Watch. And he was there, now that had been fought over many times, and of course very often uh, they were just buried where they fell, or, or close to where they fell. And somebody had been fighting here, and had been buried here, the people who buried uh, the, the body didn't know who it was, nobody knew who it was, an unknown British soldier of the Black Watch. He thought about this, and he thought, I wonder how many, I wonder how many have lost their lives like this and been buried under unmarked, well maybe marked, but unknown graves. And he began to think about it and thought how sad that was, and thinking about how many families back maybe in the United Kingdom, maybe abroad in the Empire, how many families are grieving and they don't know what's happened to their loved ones and they don't know where they are and they've been unidentified. This was really something I think which was quite new in warfare because uh, in past conflicts, on many occasions at least, it was quite easy to identify the dead. But World War I was such a slaughterhouse and it opened up new ways of mass destruction that this was happening on a scale that was quite unknown before and so at the end of the war they reckoned that there were I think these are the British figures there were at least 200,000 graves of men who died and no one knew who was in the grave they were unidentified well he didn't know that at the time but this seed was in his mind, what could we do to, to maybe ease the suffering, ease the grief of people at home who've lost their loved ones and nobody knows where they're lying. He thought about this for a while and he said that the idea came into his mind with increasing clarity that perhaps it would be a wonderful thing to just take one unknown soldier, one unknown warrior back from the front, take him back to Britain, bury him with full honours among the kings and statesmen in Westminster Abbey and that somehow this unknown warrior would be a representative he would represent all the others, the thousands of others 
who were lost and were lying in unknown graves all over the Western Front, particularly at that time. Well, during the war, he just kept that thought to himself because, of course, there was, there was so much going on, it wasn't a time for doing anything. But he thought at the end of the war, I'll pick this up again and I'll, I'll see if I can push this forward. And so he did when the war eventually ended. And it was, I think, at the end of 1919, uh, 1918 into 1919, he contacted uh, Sir Douglas Haig and uh, he didn't get a reply. I suppose Sir Douglas Haig was quite busy and also uh, at that time, just immediately after the war, it was very raw. It was very raw. Things, were, things had been experienced in the First World War that had never been experienced by mankind on that scale before. The millions who died in the war. And for many people, I was just talking to somebody today about this, and they said they had a relative who was involved in the war, and they just, they just literally buried it. They, they just didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to revisit it. They wanted to go back to their lives and, and try and pick up life again. And they'd seen so many horrific things. And I think that things after the war, immediately after the war, were just so wrong that this was something that just wasn't really going to take place. However, it was 1920. He didn't give up the idea. He's, he's now uh, down in Margate, I think he was by this time. He didn't give up the idea. He thought this is an idea that might bring comfort to many people. And so he contacted Herbert E. Ryle, who was the Dean of Westminster. Now, if there are Bible students here, they will know the name J.C. Ryle, J.C. Ryle of Liverpool. Herbert Ryle is his son. He was an evangelical uh, Christian who was the Dean of Westminster Abbey. And uh, Railton, who was also an evangelical Christian, knew him and thought, well, he might have more influence than I would have. And so he wrote to him and outlined his idea that perhaps it would be nice to bring a body back and have this as a kind of representative. Well, uh, Ryle really was taken with this idea and, and said, yes, I think that's great. And so he wrote to the Prime Minister, who was Lord George at the time, and he also wrote to the King, uh, King George V, and it was decided that yes, they would go ahead with this. And this is where the idea came from, the idea of bringing back one body as a representative of all those who were lost. So what we decided to do, this was November uh, 1920. And they decided that they would exhume four bodies from four main battlefields. And so they went to these four locations, uh, the British Army, and they exhumed four bodies. They placed them in four basic timber coffins and they brought uh, the coffins to St. Paul, uh, a village in France, and put them in the chapel there and put the four coffins in the chapel and draped each one with a Union flag. The man who was in charge of all the troops in France at that time was Brigadier General uh, Louis Wyatt and he that same evening, this I think was on the 7th of November, he that same evening with his um, assistant, uh, they went into the chapel on their own. Uh, apparently he stood between the four coffins and he closed his eyes and he placed his hand on one of the coffins and the unknown warrior was selected. The three remaining coffins were taken out, the bodies were reburied in France and the coffin that was selected containing the remains of what would become known as the unknown warrior was taken to Boulogne that had been prepared for this body, a special coffin. This coffin was made from oak uh, from Hampton Palace Gardens. And you can see the iron bands around the coffin and clasped in the iron bands right on the front there is a, crusade, a crusader's sword from the 16th century. And it was from the Tower of London, from the collection of the Tower of London. And so this coffin was made and the coffin, the plain wooden coffin containing the remains of this unknown warrior was placed inside this special coffin and the coffin was sealed. The next day, I think we're now on the 9th of November, the coffin containing the unknown warrior was taken from <coughs> Boulogne down to 
the docks. It was loaded onto HMS Verdun, which was the destroyer, and HMS Verdun then took the unknown warrior in this coffin across the channel to Dover. At Dover, here is a, a photograph of the arrival of the coffin at Dover, uh, being taken off the ship, and a guard of honour as the coffin, the remains, are carried up and they were placed on a special train and the train left for Victoria Station in London. This was on the 10th of November. The train stayed in Victoria Station overnight with an armed guard and the following morning, which was Armistice Day, 1920, it was November the 11th, 1920, the unknown warrior began his uh, procession from Victoria Station to Westminster Abbey. Along the route, the route was lined with, with thousands of people who, of course, had been told that it was coming and were gathered there to pay their respects. So there was absolute silence as uh, the cortege uh, moved along at slow pace. And when they got to the cenotaph, the cenotaph in Whitehall, this was a new monument. In fact, what you're seeing on the photograph there was actually a wooden mock-up of the monument. And it was unveiled this morning by King George V as the unknown warrior stopped just at the cenotaph and the crowds were there, then the king unveiled the new memorial, the cenotaph memorial. And from then, uh, from there, he placed a, a, a wreath on the a coffin of the unknown warrior and then they followed uh, the coffin. The king and the royals with him and the chiefs of staff of the military followed the coffin uh, on foot to Westminster Abbey. Well, at Westminster Abbey there was a, a crowd of a thousand invited people waiting inside the abbey. As the coffin was brought in, there was an honour guard of a hundred men who had won the Victoria Cross in the First World War and the coffin was taken into uh, Westminster Abbey. It was a very moving ceremony uh, during which they sang hymns like Abide With Me and Lead Kindly Light. They sang Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd, and the coffin eventually was placed uh, over the grave and then lowered down into the grave that had been prepared for the unknown warrior. And just as it was being lowered down, uh, the king uh, poured into the grave soil from the battlefields of France. And so the grave was covered over, the service was complete, and a guard of honour was uh, mounted around the grave. Well, over the next uh, week, uh, the public were allowed to come in, and uh, I don't know how many, but crowds of the public uh, came, filed past in silence to pay their respects to this unknown warrior who, in the minds of many, of course, represented so many more who had been lost. You might know uh, this lady. Any participation here? Does anyone know who that is? Queen mother. It's the Queen Mother. She wasn't the Queen Mother then, of course, uh, because that's a wedding day. And she was married in Westminster Abbey. Now, if you watch any of the processions in Westminster Abbey, you'll see that if they come in in a group, then they've either got to split or they've got to move to one side to get round the tomb of the unknown. You can't avoid it. That was deliberate. You can't avoid it. And as they were coming out uh, after the wedding ceremony, she impulsively took her wedding bouquet and laid it on the tomb of the unknown soldier, the unknown warrior. And that, of course, began uh, a tradition which goes on to this day, that every royal wedding, uh, the bride's bouquet is placed on the tomb of the unknown soldier. A year later, so it's exactly 100 years this year, in 1921, 11th November 1921, there was a special dedication ceremony, and they prepared this uh, stone, this gravestone, which was uh, black uh, Belgian marble, and they prepared this uh, to go over the grave and there's a special ceremony exactly 100 years ago this month, the 11th of November 1921. So this became, and still is today, if you go to Westminster Abbey you'll see it and you'll, you'll very often see there are people laying flowers on it 
uh, there are people who are maybe kneeling down beside it, paying their respects, and very often because, not just in the First World War, but the Second World War and the various conflicts all over the world, uh, there have been people lost who've never been recovered, who've never been found. And this was a way of a tangible expression of grief. And this uh, unknown warrior represented all the people who were lost. And of course this idea was adopted, it was a, it was a new thing, but it was adopted by other countries as well. So if you go to America, go to other countries in the world, you'll find that they too have their unknown warriors, unknown soldiers. They uh, memorialize. Uh, in this way. So it's quite fitting, I think, that a hundred years ago this was dedicated and we remember perhaps you have relatives who fought in wars in the past and of course you know them, maybe you don't know where they're buried. Uh, certainly many people never knew where their loved ones were. I just want to talk a wee bit now about the inscription. The inscription was designed by our friend uh, Herbert Ryle. And he designed it, he got all the wording together. I don't know if you can read it. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can have a read of it. It's quite moving. And at the bottom, you might be able to see, it says that uh, uh, he was buried among the kings because he had done good toward God and toward his house. Now, here's a quiz. Does anyone know where that comes from? That's from the Bible. That's straight from the Bible. Well, I'll tell you because I looked it up. And it is a man called Jehoiada, who wasn't a king, but he was a good man. And what he did, the nation appreciated him so much that they buried him among the kings. And dear friends, that's what we're thinking of tonight. That this man, unknown, who knows who he is, uh, but whoever he was, he had such an honor that he represents those who fought for liberty and freedom and is buried in honor among the kings. But Herbert, Herbert Royal had this idea that he wanted the unknown warrior to be surrounded by the Word of God. And so if you go into the, the Westminster Abbey and you walk up to it, you'll find there's a text on the bottom. There's a text running up the side. There's a text running up the side. There's a text over the top. I just want to point them out to you. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this before. But if you come in, the one that's right at the bottom says, In Christ shall all be made alive. In other words, here is the message. Here is a grave. And yet because of Christ, because of his coming, because of his death, this is not the end. This is not the end. There's going to be a resurrection. That grave is going to be opened again. And so is every grave. Because Christ came, and the Bible says, in Adam all die. We all die because of what Adam did. But there's going to be life and resurrection because of what Christ did. That's the first one at the bottom. I'll just run through these. And then up the left-hand side, a text that you're maybe familiar with. Greater love has no man than this. Again, commemorating the sacrifice that this unknown warrior has made and many others Greater love, to lay down your life, the Lord Jesus said, to lay down his life for his friends. And so it's commemorating the, the sacrifice and the love of people like this unknown warrior who gave their all. But dear friends, the Lord Jesus did say that. But he said that's the greatest love that a man can show. That's the greatest love a man can show. But he said, I'm going to show you a greater love than that. I'm going to die for my enemies. Yeah. I'm going to die for my enemies. Dear friends, we are indebted to people who died for this nation, for our country, for their folks back home. I don't think anyone willingly laid down their life for the enemy. That's not to take away from their sacrifice. But the Bible says that when we were enemies, Christ died for us. And so uh, it's the sacrifice and the love. And then on the right hand side, here's a kind of paradox. Again, the quoting from the Bible, unknown and yet well known, dying and behold we live. And Paul wrote this when he wrote to the uh, Christians at Corinth. And what he was saying is that it's possible to be completely unknown by men and yet be known by God. In fact, many of the inscriptions in these graves in, 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 uh, in France and Belgium uh, a soldier of the great war known only to God and so Paul is saying it's possible to be unknown by men but of course we're known to God 
as unknown and yet well known, dying and behold we live. This is a paradox that, that where there is death, there is still life, there is still existence, there is still going on in existence forever. And so this is a kind of paradox that we have to uh, take account of uh, in Christianity. And then the one I would really want to talk about tonight, just for a few minutes as we bring this to a close, is right at the top. And I think that the one at the top is really the... Uh, Herbert uh, Royal made this as the kind of climax. You start at the bottom with the resurrection, you think of sacrifice, you think of this paradox of death and life, and then you come to the top. And the text at the top says this, The Lord knoweth them that are his. Now you can understand why that was chosen, because here is the unknown soldier. Nobody knows who he is. In fact, there was a bit of a debate in later years that some people didn't know who he was. And it was gone into quite thoroughly, and it was established that really nobody knew. It was, it was a complete mystery. So that anyone who lost the loved one can say, well, it could be my loved one. Uh, but this verse was chosen because it's the tomb of the unknown warrior. But the verse says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let me just say something about that before we close tonight. The Lord knows them that are his. There are two things I just want to point out about this text on the grave of the unknown warrior. First of all, the Lord knows them. Now, it's possible, of course, to know about somebody. Nobody knows anything about this person who's buried in the unknown warrior's grave. Nobody knows where he was born, what his name was, even what nationality he was, what family he had. Nobody knows anything about him. It's a complete mystery. But this text tells us, well, the Lord knows. The Lord knows all about him. Dear friends, the Lord knows all about you. And so the details that we know nothing about, about our lives and about other people's lives, they're all known to him. The Lord knows. But the text means something more than that. You see, I might know, I might know about somebody. I know something about the Queen. I can read a book about her. I can find out what she likes and doesn't like. I can find out about her, her family and so on. I can know quite a bit about the Queen, but I don't know the Queen. In the sense that there's any bond, there's any link, there's any relationship. And this text really means that there are people, and it's not just that the Lord knows all about them. He knows them. There's a personal link with him. Now, I don't know anything about this unknown warrior. I don't know whether he believed in Christ. I don't know whether he's a Christian or not. But I can say this. That if he was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Bible says that the Lord knows him. In that sense, that he has a relationship with him. I wonder, I'm just going to ask you tonight, do you know the Lord Jesus? Does he know you? You remember that famous chapter in John chapter 11, when uh, John chapter 10, sorry, when the Lord Jesus spoke about himself as the good shepherd. And he says, I know my sheep and I'm known by them. There's a link between me and my sheep. I have a relationship with them. And so this verse is saying there are certain people and the Lord knows them. And they know the Lord. They've come to know him. They've come to know him as their saviour. They've come to trust in him. They've come to believe in him. And so this idea of knowing, it's all about relationship. And so the verse is really saying that there are people and the Lord doesn't just know about them. But he knows them. He has a link with them because they are trusting in him. And then the second part is that these people are described as being his. Now, it was quite moving apparently when they brought the coffin of the unknown warrior into Westminster Abbey. They had invited 100 widows whose husbands were lying in unmarked graves. And they said that when the coffin entered there was, a, there was a kind of audible gasp from these widows and many were weeping openly because they were all thinking, that could be mine. That could be my husband. That could be my Jimmy or my Arthur or whoever it was. That could be mine. But this verse is telling us that there are people and the Lord says, they're mine. The Lord knows those who are his. Uh, you might say, well, isn't that true of every human being? Is every human being not, not belong to him? 
No, this is not what the verse is saying. The verse is saying that there are those who have come to trust in the Lord Jesus, who have come to believe in him, and they are in a relationship with him, and that relationship means that they belong to him. And it tells us not only about this relationship, but it tells us that they are redeemed. Now, I don't know anything about this soldier who lies there at Westminster Abbey, but I can tell you this, that if any individual, if anyone in this if anyone in this congregation tonight has come to the Lord Jesus as a sinner and believed that he died for me on the cross and has trusted him to be the Savior, then the Lord knows you and the Lord owns you. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. You've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. I wonder tonight as, as the Lord looks down on this group of people here in awe, the Bible says the Lord knows, in this company, those who are his. He knows those who have trusted in him. I just want to, as we bring ourselves to close, just to remind you of this, that on the grave of the unknown warrior, as we commemorate and remember the sacrifice of others, remember this, that there is something even more profound, that, that is even more moving, that is even more important than, than remembering people who laid down their lives for liberty and freedom. It's remembering this, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, once hung on a cross for my sins. And he gave himself as a sacrifice for me. And when I was just a boy, I came to know him. I trusted him to be my saviour. The Lord knows them that are his. And when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he paid the price for my salvation. Now, dear friends, can I just ask you as we close tonight, are you one of those? The Bible would describe the Lord knows them that are his.